All right, welcome to the conversation. So uh, is the Biden administration and the Democratic Party doing enough to uh, deliver for black voters? Uh, my answer is a definitive no. Uh, but the issue overall is more complicated than that. So we're gonna bring in Terrence Woodbury. He is the CEO of His Strategies, a data scientist. And uh, Terrence, first, welcome. And thank you so much for having me, Jake. No problem. Uh, you guys did a focus group with black voters, is that right? That's right. We are in uh, constant focus groups and polling with black voters, keeping our finger on the pulse there of the most loyal voters in the Democratic coalition. Yeah. So, um, before we get into, are they doing enough? Are they not? Is it messaging? Is it substance? Uh, I'm super interested in what the focus group said. So what did they say? Yeah, so we see the same thing in the data that we're seeing in the focus groups that uh, that Democrats and Joe Biden, more specifically, are experiencing a precipitous erosion of this of the Biden coalition that was anchored uh, by Black voters. We see his approval rating has dropped now. Uh, by 10 points amongst black voters just in the last 90 days. And even more significantly uh, amongst black voters under 50, who we know are amongst the, the more likely voters to, uh, to, to, to fall off during a midterm election where we, see, where we see political participation drop significantly. And black voters in focus groups are, ex, are expressing uh, frustration, uh, crises of confidence about whether or not Democrats will really deliver on some of their top issues. Okay, so that's amazing information, so give me more. Um, so what are the reasons for their frustration? Uh, do they say specifics, do they talk about generalities? Uh, why are they peeling off and getting uh, super frustrated with Biden? I mean, you know, Cenk, this is largely a uh, more of a governing problem than a messaging problem. You know, Democrats have in fact delivered on a lot of the priorities uh, that, that black voters showed up in overwhelming numbers in 2020 to advance. They have not done enough, but they are also not getting credit for what they have done. And this is where uh, there's, there's quite a messaging gap. When you look at police reform, you know, and I tell black voters uh, about what the Justice Department has done to ban choke codes and no knock warrants amongst federal officers, um, even uh, launching the uh, um, uh, uh, pattern and practice investigation, pattern and practice investigations more than any other administration in their first term, they've already done in their first year. Black voters just aren't aware of that and they get uh, significantly more supportive when they learn about it. Um, they're not getting, the, the administration is not getting credit for the significant uh, efforts that they have made in reducing the spread of COVID, specifically in distributing the vaccine uh, equitably in a way that has closed, completely eliminated the mortality gap between black people and white people from, from COVID infections. <clears throat> and, and so on and so on, on issues of climate, on uh, economic recovery, and, 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 um, and even in, in, in their most recent investments through the infrastructure bill, black voters just are not aware of this progress. And they're calling it all a little uh, too, too short and too short and, and, and and too too long to get to. Yeah, Terrence, uh, there's a great reason for that. So this is not clear cut whether it's just me messaging or substance. Uh, the reality is the Biden administration, in my opinion, sucks on both. Uh, and so on the things that they have done well that you're talking about here, they have a complete, uh, they're completely incapable of delivering that message. Why, why don't you say it? Why don't you talk about it? Why don't you do a news conference? Why don't you create a controversy around it? They don't do it because they it would might hurt the feelings of their, of their beloved, beloved Republican colleagues. So they are the world's worst messengers, I will grant you that. On the other hand, Terrence, you have to admit, it's also a substance problem. So yes, look, chokeholds, that's a tiny uh, win because the reality is chokeholds were actually banned in most places. The cops still do the chokeholds even though they're banned. Uh, and so that is not a big substantive win at all. The pattern of practice is more substantive uh, and and you know, and there they've got that message is out to no one, no one, right? That's but right. but That's parents, exactly right. but more importantly, they haven't even done voting rights. So when you haven't done voting rights, and that is a mountain of an issue. It's a little hard to brag about the pimple that you did do. No, that's exactly right, Jenkins. And, and I think that the, 
that the reason they are not carrying a more assertive message about this points to a larger problem in the Democratic Party. It's a debate that we have seen taking place publicly, and that is, you know, the false choice of should Democrats advance an economic agenda or should they respond to the overwhelming racism and insidious dog whistles that we're hearing from Republicans? And that is a false choice. And in fact, when they hear this silence or even worse, appeasement, like we heard from the president when he talked about, you know, the 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 justice system doing what it was supposed to do in response to Rittenhouse, or when we see the erosion of black support in Virginia after um, after Terry McAuliffe was all but silent uh, on issues of, of race and, and critical race theory, that this is a those are value signals to black voters. That is Democrats sending a value. A value signal on what they hold important, and frankly, their their silence on these issues is deafening. And it's not just a moral imperative, Jang. This is a this is a, a strategic imperative. Democrats have an opportunity to not own, to to begin to win on issues of race by leaning into an affirmative and an aspirational vision of diversity in America. We know exactly what Republicans believe about diversity. It's bad. Close the borders. Keep out the black and brown people, lock up more of them, Muslim bans. I mean, we know what they want to slow down the diversity in America in order to make it great again. But what do Democrats believe about diversity? And leaning into that really does uh, does present an opportunity to, be, to, to, to speak to the number one issue of their most loyal voters. And that's just, those are not just issues of black voters. Those are issues of young voters. That we can actually mobilize the most passionate activists on the left the same way Republicans are mobilizing the most passionate racists on the right. And I'm not sure why Democrats don't recognize that opportunity and really lean into some of these issues. So this is a nonstop debate about should we fight Republicans on social issues or economic issues? The answer is the most obvious thing in the world, both. Uh, it's it's not That's that right. complicated. You have the bully pulpit. Trump used it 18 times a day uh, to attack on every front, and Biden uses it zero times on zero issues to attack Republicans on zero uh, social or economic issues. So we say both. He says neither. Uh, Political just had an article last week about how Biden absolutely refuses to attack Republicans. And so, yeah, gee, I wonder why nobody knows what you're up to and you don't get credit for the small things that you did and you surrender nonstop on Rittenhouse. Oh, the jury was fantastic, yay, Rittenhouse. What an awful statement by Biden. And Kamala Harris's statement wasn't any better. You haven't done anything on voting rights. And, and Terrence, when you go to police reform, they ask Republican permission. Hey, Lindsey Graham, Tim Scott, can we please have police reform? And the Republicans are like, oh, yeah, yeah, negotiate with us for a year, and then maybe we'll give you police reform. Ha, ha, just kidding. We're Republicans. Of course, we're not going to give you police reform. So, I mean, Terrence, how do they? I'm surprised more African Americans haven't pulled away because this is a joke. It's insulting. You're insulting our intelligence by pretending you're doing enough when, like, It doesn't it seem absolutely clear they care the Biden administration cares more about its Republican colleagues than do they do about black voters. Look, I want to make no mistake about it. I I do believe that Democrats, at least the Democrats that I work with, you know, are on the right side of issues of race and of justice. But it doesn't matter if you're silent on those issues, you know. Uh, when we when we talk about harnessing the overwhelming energy on the left, I often point to you know I, I encourage the, the the Democratic candidates that I, that I work with to look towards the the summer of unrest and the summer of 2020 when we saw the complexion of the protest change when we saw uh, you know a movement evolve from black people versus the police to a movement of young people versus racism. Those were young people that were taken to the streets in every city in America. And those young people, many of them were either not voters or they were single issue voters. Their single issue is racism. And so yes, we, we, you know, that, that, that energy, that passion that we saw from those young voters actually resulted in political participation. We saw young people's voter registration double in Wisconsin after the after the protests in Kenosha. We saw young people's participation in Democratic primaries double in Georgia when those protests coincided 
with the Democratic primaries there. And so we, we see this, this, uh, this model from Republicans where they are throwing red meat to their base, throwing red meat to, 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 to white, rural, non-college educated voters that are the most anxious about diversity. And in Virginia, we saw that red meat in the form of critical race theory. But Democrats are not throwing the same red meat to the most passionate activists on the left. And you're right, Cenk, some of those issues, some of that red meat does present itself in the form of police reform, of voting rights, of, of critical race theory. We can't, our response to critical race theory can't be, well, we don't teach that in schools. That is a complete dismissal of what black voters and young voters have told us is their number one issue, and that is racism. And so this is a this is a challenge, but it really does present an opportunity to, to reassemble that coalition. Um, and, and the third part of that coalition, and this is really important, is that these issues of race and justice are not unique to black voters, and they're not unique to young voters. That in fact, what repelled many college educated white uh, suburban women away from Donald Trump was insidious racism, it was division. And so we have an opportunity as we lean into diversity as our strength, as we present a rationale for how diversity in fact makes the country stronger. We're not just talking to black people. We're not just talking to young people. We're talking to the broader coalition. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that I have to convince Democrats that anti-racism is a majority opinion. You know, we're not convincing them to take an unpopular opinion. Most Americans are in fact anti-racist. Yeah. Let's talk to them and let's give them a reason to support Democrats in the next election. Uh, honestly, Terrence, the, the corporate Democrats are nearly hopeless. Uh, it, they're afraid of their own shadow. They're completely afraid of the Republicans. They're afraid of their own donors. Uh, and, and so the simplest messages that have overwhelming popularity, they will not do under penalty of law. But now, last thing, as quickly as we can, you talked about younger voters a couple of times, and it's really interesting. That's to me more interesting. So, two different questions about that. One, are you seeing that the under, you said under 50, the under 50 voters, are they, how much more solidly progressive are they as opposed to the older voters? So we have a real opportunity here. You know, during during that summer of unrest, we started doing some polling and even following some by the Kaiser Family Foundation that showed that 80% of young voters of all races believe that black people are mistreated by the police. That 79% believed it was harder to get ahead in America if you were black. That 82% believe that America should do more to reduce the effects of racism. Democrats aren't winning 82% of young people or 80% or 79%. In fact, in many states across the South, they're breaking even. Joe Biden was at 53, 47 with, with voters under the, age of, under the age of 40. And so uh, while, they, while they do align with, with, with Democrats on issues of race, especially being the majority minority generation, you know, this is the internet generation. The melting pot generation, there is an opportunity as Republicans continue to make racism, explicit racism, a central theme of their platform. Democrats have an opportunity uh, to, yeah. to, 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 to begin to, to, build, to, to build that coalition of young people uh, right. up and down the ballot. So Terrence, one last thing then. Uh, so yeah, they have that opportunity, they'll blow that opportunity, it's the usual uh, stuff. But w how about within African Americans? Are younger voters uh, who are African American more progressive or much more progressive than older African American voters? No, in fact, uh, unfortunately, the the one of the greatest uh, the greatest uh, determining factors of whether or not a black person will support a Republican is their age. The younger the black voter is, the more likely they are to to defect to Republicans. This is not uh, this is not a a product of them being more conservative. It is a product of them being more cynical towards Democrats and more open to a to a receptive Republican message. And so we do have work to do there. Our, our, the coalition of black voters that once voted for Democrats at 90%, it is splintering, especially amongst younger voters. And that was not unique to Donald Trump. Even David Perdue doubled his margins of black voters under the age of 40. 
Granted, he doubled them from 6% to 12%. But in a state that was decided by 10,000 votes, that is enough to determine the margin of difference. So, but Terrence, one last thing though, but within the Democratic Party, um, so there's a giant rift between the establishment and progressives. The establishment says, kiss Republican ass, don't do much. Uh, and progressives say, no, fight them, fight them on social issues, etc. And, and economic issues. I don't know that you tested that. So I'm curious if you did test that, if you've seen mm -hmm. the generational uh, divide there. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, this is where we see the energy of the, of the, of the, the activist wing of the Democratic Party. You know, that, that is exactly who we saw in the coalition that was protesting in the summer of 2020. It is young people, young people of color. Um, <clears throat> and so, that, so, you know, we have to lean into that. And, and one thing that we have to stop doing immediately is oppositioning our activists. We have to stop saying stuff like, uh, we don't teach critical race theory, or we oppose defunding the police, or just being completely silent on issues of voting rights. We have to begin to uh, welcome our most passionate activists into our coalition the same way the right is, is, is embracing their, their craziest and most radical activists, no matter how uh, uh, unappealing it is to the general public, they are harnessing that energy. Well, our activists are on the right side of history and we have to start uh, uh, welcoming them into the Democratic coalition. Yeah, and there's a very, very good reason for that because corporate Democrats uh, hate their base. They, they dislike their base way more than they dislike their Republican colleagues and they are in love with their donors. And so, and the donors do not like any of the progressive talk. So they will, they are siding with their donors and it is going to absolutely destroy the country because it's gonna hand it over to Republicans who are at this point have lost their minds. And so we are headed to a clear disaster, 22 and 24. I mean, look, it's not hyperbole to say 24 could end the country. If Trump or Tucker Carlson wins, they are, Actual fascists, they will end democracy. And it's because corporate Democrats were in love, where they were in love with their corporate donors. And they and they sided with them over their actual base. And so that is the destruction of the Democratic Party brought to you by the corrupt leadership of the Democrats. All right, Terrence Woodbury, we appreciate the facts and, uh, and thank you for coming on and sharing those. Thank you so much, I'll be on anytime, Jim.